I'm, I'm very, very hopeful um, that it will have a, a positive effect. Um, and I also am more also interested in like the effect of Eptown on, on many of the systems talks, right? Um, because now that we have this resolution, we can start breaking down on which organ system it might be most beneficial to, and then how maybe how it's mediating its effects across the body. Hi, Ryan. Yeah, so it's great to uh, have you back on the podcast again. It feels like quite a while. So, yeah, we've got quite a few topics to dive into. I don't know, with Epitalon, have you seen much in the way of, um, from your experience, like changing epigenetic clocks from it and like gene expression benefits? So... Um... It's, uh, it's hard to say because we don't have a, a controlled trial, but I will say that, that uh, Dr. Edwin Lee, actually the same uh, physician from Orlando who we were doing the decidive and quercetin and Visin trial with, we're also doing two more trials with him right now at the moment. One is on Epitalon. Um, it's only going to be 10 patients, so it's going to be still very small. The other one is on uh, growth hormone deficiency um, and, and, and growth hormone to people who are growth hormone deficient um, to see what happens with some of these clocks. And, and, and so uh, we're doing both of those right now. Um, I don't have any data back just yet, but um, but uh, I think I'm excited to see it. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. one of the great things about the Epitalon is I think the, the side effect profile, right? Uh, you know, it's just four amino acids, um, mm -hmm. and uh, and and I think that generally I've never ever seen a negative impact with the Epitalon, um, and so uh, you know I'm, I'm very very hopeful um, that it will have a, a positive effect, um, and I also am more also interested in like. The effect of Epitalon on, on many of the systems clocks, right? Because um, mm -hmm. now that we have this resolution, we can start breaking down on which organ system it might be most beneficial to, and then how maybe how it's mediating its effects across the body. Um, you know, in a lot of the preliminary Epitalon data by uh, uh, Dr. Cavinson, it really was studied for cardiovascular disease and reducing oh, yeah. cardiovascular disease events. Yes, and respiratory and so, uh, diseases as well, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I'd be really curious to see once we look at that data, are mm -hmm. we seeing, you know, maybe gene expression patterns which improve, um, you know, uh, maybe lung or cardiovascular function more than anything, um, or or maybe seeing if we can connect to circadian rhythm patterns. Right, that would also be very interesting. Yeah, um, yeah. funny uh, enough, it, you say that, yeah. and then I'm I'm looking at that data at the moment. I'm about I think 14 days in. I'm doing 20 days of it, and I'm 14 days in, and I'm looking at my whoop, and then I'm seeing this progression of my sleep, and then interestingly, my I remember this, from, this is my fourth cycle of it and my dreams get a lot more. I don't generally dream very much. I don't remember them. They're very, very hazy. And then now I get really vivid dreams like in the previous cycle. So it's definitely the increased my, uh, melatonin production is for sure. Like, I mean, I do things like 5-HTP and I don't get that. But whereas with Epitolon, I really it is noticeable. Yeah, that, uh, that's fascinating. I, I, you know, I think that... Uh... You know, whenever we get into even some of that, it makes sense, right? It, there were there's studies in male rats on the epitalon where they increase neuron activity when they go to bed after you know after mm -hmm. uh, intranasal doses of the epitalon, um, and and so I think that uh, that makes perfect sense to me. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm and my my biggest question would be what downstream benefits is that having, right? If you're getting better sleep, mm -hmm. does that mean better REM sleep? Does that mean better deep sleep? Does that mean you're having a faster repair and recovery time? You know, is it you know uh, maybe down regulating your cortisol and uh, um, you know, or some of those other, you know, circadian rhythm patterns. And so I think that that's really why I'm interested in diving into mm. data is, is we see all these anecdotal <sighs> benefits, but why are they happening? Uh, right? What's, you know, maybe mm. what are some of the biggest pathways that are actually affected? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then, I mean, that, that that's my, I've mentioned it previously, my, that's one of our weaknesses is sleep. And then interestingly, mm -hmm. I noticed my um, stress markers were going up like cortisol and then um, you know, even on my whoop and then my sleep. My sleep scores were going down like back in March uh, in, into April and then uh, my Dunoon and Pace, it really negatively affected that, like went up by seven points, not not quite. Oh, interesting. Yeah, yeah, almost what it was like a year ago, but um, and I'm sure like, everything else in my routine is <laughs> pretty much virtually identical, maybe a few improvements, I'm cutting out certain uh, pesticides out of my diet, that kind of thing, but yeah, it's a big increase and I, I noticed, my, yeah, my body i was having so much bad sleep that really i'll just have really bad days where um yeah it's just and, I, and then i noticed my yeah. telomeres getting significantly shorter big drop in telomere length so i'm yeah. thinking they, they, i have read a lot about that telomeres being linked to um you know high stress levels so i'm guessing the denounced pace is there must be a link with stress and sleep and all that kind of thing yeah, yeah, certainly. And, and actually, one of the, I always, this is a funny story, but um, leukocyte telomere length is actually measured in the Dunedin Pace cohort. Um, and, and so they originally had put it in the clock for training. 
but actually they found that it actually was less predictive with the inclusion of leukocyte telomere length than not. So they actually took it out of that algorithm. Oh, okay. um, and, and so it's not directly trained on leukocyte telomere length, but I know that, as you mentioned, it definitely has a lot of those correlations between you know sleep and, and, and telomere length in general. So I think that probably some of the things which are decreasing telomere length are certainly you know uh, uh, increasing that pace of aging. Mm. Yeah, so I'm very keen to see uh, my my latest score. I think it's definitely should have gone back in the right direction because physically I feel better, like more rested. I mean, because I even um, introduced something um, interesting going off topic a little bit, metazapine, which is it's classified. I don't know if you heard of that one. It's classified as no. an antidepressant, but you get it prescribed for sleep too. So it's like a sedative. And um, yeah, it's kind of interesting to find out to see if that... Um, because I think yeah, like being yeah. myself being a workaholic and then it can have the um, side effect of like lassitude, you know, like more lethargy, like laziness, that kind of thing. But I think if you're, yeah. for me, is if everything about everything <laughs> else in my life is optimized, it's actually kind of balanced me out. So I kind of, I don't wake up at 4am ready to go and I've had, you know, I'm way underslept. Like, um, so yeah, it's definitely, I'd be interested to see how it benefits my, you know, epigenetic aging. Yeah. Yeah. I would look forward to seeing that as well. Mm. Um, you know, uh, yeah, you know, just on that aside as well, uh, you know, um, uh, Albert Higgins Chin, one of our collaborators at Yale, um, is actually one of his areas of focus. He's a uh, an MD and a PhD, but his his MD was uh, in psych psychiatry. Um, so he's actually looking at why every single mental illness is also correlated with advanced biological ages mm. um, across the board. Um, and I, I think that's an interesting, uh, uh, maybe a, you know, another topic for another day. But I think that. Yeah. Um, it's, it's really interesting because he's looking for a, maybe a, a single etiology that might be driving that or vice versa. Maybe the, you know, levels of happiness are obviously affecting our aging and and looking for that mechanistic action. I think it's really, really interesting. Um, and mm -hmm. so, I, but yeah, yeah, I, I'm familiar with, uh, uh, you know, the Rimeron. I would say it's more the, the commercial name that we would know it here in the United States. But uh, but yeah, no, I'd be yeah, it's definitely an interesting anecdote. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I think there's a lot of link. They all talk about that, you know, the blue zones that people live a long time. They tend to tend to focus on being happy and doing things they enjoy. And yeah, so I think there's definitely a strong link. I don't know. I said a video on that Tarando Tan, you know, the uh, yeah. 58 year old. And then that was his kind of, you know, he works out, but he kind of, you know, he enjoys it. He doesn't just do it out of routine. He, he can contributes his youthful look to leading a kind of more fulfilling, happy life. Yeah, we're doing some studies right now, uh, just on even uh, lonely people in Appalachia versus not lonely people. Mm -hmm. um, I think we know that that, that it, the amount of interaction, the amount of close relationships, um, certainly helps. And, and you know, in, in this biohacking realm, we might always you know be very interested, me, me included, on trying the newest and greatest drug, but maybe put a little bit less effort into some of those relationships and you know building mm -hmm. those things, which might be equally important, might even have a bigger delta. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Same with meditation. I used to think that was a bit woo woo, and then now I'm kind of doing a bit of that, and then can, combining. <laughs> We say with red light therapy at the same time, that kind of thing, and then I think, yeah, I think it definitely does benefit. I mean, there's there is some evidence on it. Certainly, absolutely, mm. no, uh, and I, yeah, I was the same way. I think, uh, and now now I uh, I've done a complete one eighty. I think it's so important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, when you can't relax in the evening, then obviously it's the one thing. You know, you have your day, you strain, you push yourself, but then you need to have periods of rest and recovery where you're letting your brain calm down and just unwinding otherwise you know you're just in burnout mode aren't you yeah exactly exactly mm. um yeah but, but again i think lots of lots of uh um you know lots of new information coming out daily I, i've never been you know coming away from this conference never been more excited to be in the aging space i feel like we're closer mm. to a breakthrough than ever mm. um and, and really yeah again hopefully we'll know all the levers to pull and win and why yeah yeah and then i know brian johnson talks about lithium there's a few people doing like micro doses of that aren't they um so yeah, that's kind of some... yeah. Are you doing lithium yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And um, yeah, there are multiple studies, not even just epigenetic studies um, right. that show the benefit, but epigenetic studies as well, which show the DNA methylation ages are improved with, with lithium supplementation. However, the problem with that is that usually they're not in healthy cohorts, right? They're usually studying people right, with bipolar right, yeah, disorder. Yeah, yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And so it's, it's uh, but I think that the additional mechanistic action of lithium supplementation looks really positive. So I'll do, mm -hmm. uh, you know, a lithium orotate from uh, life extension at, uh, you know, generally one milligram a day. Right. Okay. Yeah. I'm going to, I'm going to look into that one.